Monday, January 30th, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Israel to meet with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He's urging Israel and the Palestinians to exercise restraint amid a spate of violence that put the region on edge, but he does not condemn Israeli violence against the Palestinians. Memphis police disciplined two more officers involved in the arrest, beating and death of Tyree Nichols, widening the circle of punishment for a killing that's already led to the murder indictment of five officers and outraged the nation with another display of police brutality. Labor leaders and lawmakers in California announced new legislation that would regulate the proposed use of driverless trucks. President Biden goes to Baltimore, Maryland to promote his 2021 infrastructure law by replacing the Baltimore Potomac Tunnel. It could slash what's now a 60-minute Baltimore to Washington commute in half. And according to a just-released report, many of California's 13.5 million children and teens have not bounced back after the COVID pandemic. From Pacifica Radio, and the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. The Memphis Police Department today disciplined two more officers involved in the arrest, beating, and the death of Tyree Nichols. The department said today... That widens the circle of punishment for a killing that's already led to the murder indictment of five officers and outraged the nation with another display of police brutality. Officer Preston Hemphill, who was white, was relieved of duty shortly after Nichols' January 7th arrest, the department said. Five black officers had already been fired and charged last week with second-degree murder and other offenses in Nichols' beating and January 10th death. Late today, the police department said another officer had been relieved of duty. Officials did not give a name or specify what role that officer played in the arrest. In total, seven Memphis officers have been disciplined. Also today, the Memphis Fire Department announced the firing of emergency medical technicians Robert Long and Jamichael Sandridge and Fire Lieutenant Michelle Whitaker in connection with Nichols' death. Fire Chief Gina Sweat said in a statement that the department received a call from police to respond to a report of a person who had been pepper sprayed. The workers arrived at 8.41 p.m. as... Tyree Nichols was handcuffed on the ground and leading up against a squad car. The statement said Long and Sandridge, based on the nature of the call and the information they were told by police, failed to convict, conduct an adequate patient assessment of Mr. Nichols. Whitaker and the driver remained in the engine. An ambulance was summoned and took Nichols to the hospital, but not until nearly a half hour after Long, Sandridge, and Whitaker had arrived at the scene. Nichols died later in the hospital three days later. Calls for more officers to be fired or charged have been loud and persistent from the Nichols family and their lawyers and community activists who have peacefully protested in Memphis since the video of the incident was released. The video was evocative of the arrest of George Floyd in 2020 and the officer's failure to intervene. Nationwide protests over the weekend of Tyree Nichols took place over the weekend. In Memphis, activists shut down a highway. Say his name! Tyree Nichols! Say his name! Tyree Nichols! Say his name! Tyree Nichols! Say his name! People rallied in Boston. Monsters! Murderers beat Tyree Nichols and murdered him. 
They executed him. They executed him. That's exactly right. And Dallas, Texas. No, it's a real emergency. It's an emergency that we need to pass legislation like the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. It's time to move these legislations forward. Philadelphia. We're out here today because we're sick and tired of the police terror in this country. And Oakland, California. And in Washington, D.C. Activists who've peacefully protested since the video was released on Friday. The Memphis De Police Department has disbanded the controversial Scorpion crime fighting unit that the five arresting officers belong to, but activists want more to be done. Amber Sherman with Memphis Black Lives Matter. The multi-level gang unit, the organized crime unit, all work under the same umbrella as the Scorpion unit, and they need to all be disbanded as well. Because just by ending that unit, that's a good move, but then you still have these same task force who are doing that same terrorism, assaulting people, over-criminalizing uh, the poor and black, the poor and um, low-income neighborhoods, mostly where black people live, because we are a majority black city. The state's NAACP chapter is calling for lawmakers to act and pass the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. Gloria Jean Sweetlove is president of the Tennessee NAACP. We come to call the action for Congress by failing to craft and pass bills to stop police brutality. The blood of black America is on your hand, so stand up and do something. And nationally, civil rights activists are calling for congressional action. Correspondent Catherine Carley filed this report. We now have the blueprint, America, and we won't accept less going forward in the future. Civil rights attorney Ben Crump says any officer engaged in police brutality should be met with fair justice. Five black police officers were fired and charged with murder right after the death of 29-year-old Tyree Nichols of Memphis. Crump cited the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act, which passed the House in 2021 and would ban chokeholds and racial profiling. But the new Republican chair of House Judiciary says no legislation would prevent police violence. I'm Catherine Carley for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. The Congressional Black Caucus has requested a meeting with President Biden to discuss the situation. Social justice advocates have just launched a new public education campaign in California to reframe the debate about crime and punishment called Just Safe. Suzanne Potter reports. Social justice advocates have just launched a new public education campaign. It's called Just Safe, and it's aimed at changing the conversation about crime, especially in the wake of the recent mass shootings. The group Californians for Safety and Justice has released a commercial narrated by actress Jennifer Lewis making the point that safety isn't just the absence of crime, it is the presence of well-being. The group's executive director, Tanish Hollins, says these shootings and others plague a society that neglects mental health. So the goal of this is to invite conversation about doubling down on investments that lead to well-being, like mental health treatment, substance abuse treatment, education. The campaign applauds efforts to heal communities, such as the announcement last week from the California Victims' Compensation Board of a $2.5 million grant to open three new trauma recovery center offices in Stockton and Bakersfield. The state's 19 trauma recovery centers offer mental health treatment, help with medical expenses, and support groups for victims of violent crime. While accountability is important for people involved with the justice system, Hollins says she agrees with the state's efforts in recent years to prioritize rehabilitation over punishment. She calls post-incarceration programs that help people re-enter society a wise investment. Removing barriers, making sure that they have the resources they need when they return home, keeps us all safe, prevents more crime from happening, and helps our economy because we have more folks to be able to play a role. 
She notes, right now, people who've paid their debt to society often fail to recover when they face huge obstacles to finding employment and housing and must comply with onerous legal requirements. Find out more about the campaign online at JustSafe.org. For California News Service, I'm Suzanne Potter. Secretary of State Antony Blinken today pledged an ironclad commitment to Israel's security, along with support for a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian crisis. Blinken made the remarks after a meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, where he's calling for urgent steps to calm a spiraling wave of Israeli-Palestinian violence. Christopher Martinez reports. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu gave a public welcome to the United States' top diplomat Monday at a joint news conference in Jerusalem. Your visit is uh, uh, another expression, a continual expression, of the unbreakable bond between Israel and the United States. It's one of the great alliances of modern history. The event was U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken's first visit to Israel since Netanyahu returned to power as prime minister late last year, leading a new right-wing government. Blinken's visit, which had been in the planning for weeks, comes amid a spate of escalating Israeli-Palestinian violence, including a Thursday Israeli military attack in the occupied West Bank that killed 10 Palestinians, including nine in the densely populated Janine refugee camp, a Friday attack by a Palestinian gunman that killed seven civilians outside a synagogue in an annexed East Jerusalem settlement and a shooting Monday by Israeli troops that killed a Palestinian driver who the Israeli army says hit a soldier's leg. So far this year, Israeli-Palestinian violence has killed 33 Palestinians, including attackers and civilians, and six Israeli civilians, as well as a Ukrainian civilian. Pope Francis on Sunday deplored the events as what he called a death spiral. In Jerusalem, Blinken called for urgent steps to calm the violence. He expressed his condolences for the seven civilians killed in the Jerusalem attack, though he did not mention the Palestinian deaths. In the context of this attack and escalating violence, it's important that the government and people of Israel know America's commitment to their security remains ironclad. That commitment is backed up by nearly 75 years of United States support. Uh, America's commitment has never wavered. It never will. Prime Minister Netanyahu focused his remarks on Iran, saying it remains his policy to do all in his power to keep Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. He included a reference to Iran's executions of protesters. Uh, Your visit comes at an important time. It's a time where many in the international community, I would say most of the international community, have seen the true face of Iran. They've seen the barbarism of this regime against its own people. They've seen how it exports aggression uh, beyond its border and beyond the Middle East. Uh, And I think there is a common consensus that this regime must not acquire nuclear weapons. Blinken says the Biden administration agrees with Netanyahu about Iranian nukes, and he links the issue to the war in Ukraine. Uh, Just as Iran has long supported terrorists that attack Israelis and others, uh, the regime is now providing drones that Russia is using to kill innocent Ukrainian civilians. In turn, Russia is providing sophisticated weaponry to Iran. It's, it's a two-way street. Russia's ongoing atrocities only underscore the importance of providing support for all of Ukraine's needs, humanitarian, economic, and security, as it bravely defends its people and its very right to exist, a topic that we also discussed today. Blinken says the Biden administration will continue working on efforts to normalize Israeli relations with Arab states. But he says there's no substitute for progress between Israelis and Palestinians, with the goal of Palestinians and Israelis enjoying equal freedom, justice, and dignity. President Biden remains fully committed to that goal. We continue to believe that the best way to achieve it is through preserving and then realizing the vision of two states. As I said to the prime minister, anything that moves us away from that vision is, in our judgment, detrimental to Israel's long-term security and its long-term identity as a Jewish and democratic state. Given recent politics, both in Israel and the United States, there's not much prospect for action soon on a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Even a de-escalation of the current violence is not assured, but efforts continue. 
Blinken had met with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi in Cairo the day before the visit to Netanyahu, and on Tuesday he scheduled to travel to Ramallah in the West Bank to meet with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. Fighting remained largely deadlocked today in eastern Ukraine, where Russian shelling killed five civilians over the past day, as according to Ukrainian officials, as the warring side sized up their needs for renewed military pushes expected in the coming weeks. The casualties included a woman who was killed and three others who were wounded by the Russian shelling of Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city in the country's northeast. Russian troops seized large areas of the northeastern Kharkiv region in the months following its invasion of its neighbor last February, but Ukrainian counteroffenses that began in August snatched back Russian-occupied territory, notably in Kharkiv. Those successes lent weight to Ukraine's arguments that its troops could deliver more stinging defeats to Russia if its western allies provided more weaponry. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Russia hopes to drag out the war and exhaust our forces, so we have to make time our weapon. We have to accelerate developments. We have to speed up the supply and launch of new necessary military options for Ukraine. Kiev last week won promises of tanks from the United States and Germany. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, after demurring for weeks over sending Germany's Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine, looks set to dig his heels in, though, in over providing fighter jets to Ukraine. Germany would not have the key role in aircraft deliveries that it did with the Leopard tanks, which are German made and required German export approval. Military analysts say more aid is crucial if Ukraine is to block an expected. Russian spring offensive and launch its own effort to push back Russian forces. Zelensky said today keeping up the pace of ally support is crucial. The key now is speed and volume, the speed of training our military, the speed of supplying tanks to Ukraine, the amount of tank support. We have to form a fist of tanks, a fist of freedom which will not allow tyrannies rise again. We have to open the supply of long-range missiles to Ukraine, and it is important that we expand our cooperation in artillery, and we have to start supplying aircraft to Ukraine. This is our dream and our task. Meanwhile, the president of NATO member Croatia today criticized Western nations for supplying Ukraine with heavy tanks and other weapons in its campaign against invading Russian forces, saying those arms delivery will only prolong the war. Zoran Milotovic told reporters in the Croatian capital that it's mad to believe that Russia can be defeated in a conventional war. Milanovic asked, what is the goal? Disintegration of Russia? Change of the government? There is also talk of tearing Russia apart. This is mad, he added. Milanovic won the presidential election in Croatia in 2019 as a left-leaning liberal candidate, a counterpoint to the conservative government currently in power in the European Union and the NATO member state. But he has since made a turn to populist nationalism and criticized Western policies toward Russia as well as the Balkans. Andrew Coburn, Washington editor for the Harper's Magazine, is also critical of the decision by the U.S. to send its Abrams I battle tanks and by Germany and European nations that have bought its Leopard tanks to send them to Ukraine. Coburn, author of Spoils of War, Power, Profit, and the American War Machine, spoke with Philip Muldry on KPFA's Sunday show. I don't think it'll have anything more than a maybe a transitory effect on, on the battlefield, if that. I mean, first of all, 
as far as the American tax are going to con- uh, concern, the Pentagon's been very careful to say they're really going to take their time about sending them. Uh, so they might you might see an, an Abrams American tank in Ukraine about a year from now, maybe. Uh, the German tanks will turn up more sh- sooner, I mean, limited number of German tanks, but um, added to German model tanks from Poland and from, uh, I think, from Finland and from the... Maybe from, yeah, um, so they, you know, they'll arrive more quickly. But, you know, as I say, there's this... It's, it's one more magic weapon uh, that we've been, you know, every every so often, not very, with great regularity since the start of this war, we've been told, oh, we're sending this weapon and that's going to make all the difference. Um, first of all, it was javelin anti-tank missiles. Um, uh, then it was Stinger uh, anti-aircraft missiles. And then it was uh, m 155 millimeter uh, howitzers, and then it was uh, what came next: the HIMARS, uh, long-range rockets, precision uh, rockets, um, and then it was uh, the Patriot missile, which would defend, you know, Ukrainian uh, cities from the Russian Russian missiles, um, which it won't actually. And then. Uh, and now we have the tanks. I mean, what's next? Well, we know what's next because they're already talking about now they're going to send F-16 fighters. or That's the next item on the list. So none of these, in one way, none of these have had any kind of decisive effect. I mean, uh, they really haven't. In fact, contrary to what you read in the papers, I mean, at the moment, Russia is actually making gains. Um on the other hand, you know, it's very chilling news because this is a steady escalation. It's being ramped up and up and up. And we've been through, you know, those of us old enough to remember Vietnam, that was, you know, that was a toe in the water and then it was a foot in the water and then it was half a million men in the water. Um, and I think, you know, we're headed in that direction with maybe even a worse outcome. So that's why I'm depressed. So I looked up, and the Abrams tank is manufactured by General Dynamics, and uh, the hemming and hawing about sending Abrams tanks uh, to Ukraine made me wonder whether this tank actually is very functional. Uh, They kept saying that, uh, oh, it takes a lot of maintenance, and you have to be very highly skilled in order to maintain an Abrams tank, and oh, it uses jet fuel. It doesn't use uh, plain old uh, diesel, and uh, it made me think that does the Abrams tank actually work? Uh, Is with all these excuses for why we couldn't send it, it sounded like it's it's uh, a, a weapon system in in search of uh, some kind of of uh, a mission. Well, it, I mean, it, it works in that you know it's a very when it's working, it's a very formidable in, instrument. I mean, it has an enormously powerful gun and very sort of strong armor and you know very. <clears throat> electronics you know so has long uh, long range i mean in 1991 it was able to pick off the iraqi tanks before you know when the, it, we, from beyond the iraqi tanks range on the other hand i mean yeah the, you're quite right i mean it first of all it uses it's got a basically a gas turbine engine it uses jet fuel so you have to have a whole separate supply system to bring fuel to the tanks um, while everything else on the battlefield uh, you know, is dependent on diesel or maybe gasoline. Um, so there's that. It, it's incredibly delicate. It breaks down all the time. The engine clogs up the intakes, the filters, you know, <clears throat> break down. So, you know, dust is fatal to the engine. Um, it's incredibly heavy. I mean, it's a very simple thing I wrote about, which is... Um, you know, the bridges in eastern, in the former Soviet territory, uh, were all built to be able to take Soviet tanks, which tend to be lighter, about 40, 45 tons, and not built to take NATO tanks, or certainly like the Abrams or the Leopard, which weigh, I mean, actually, the I wrote the other day about the Abrams being a 60 ton tank. Actually, I got that wrong. I'd forgotten that they'd added at least 10 tons in weight. 
since it was first introduced. So it's a 70 ton plus, 70 plus ton tank. So, I mean, it's going to be quite hard to move it around. Andrew Coburn is Washington editor for the Harper's Magazine. He's author of the book Spoils of War, Power, Profit, and the American War Machine. The head of NATO, the Western Military Alliance, today called on South Korea to step up and provide Ukraine with greater military support. Nick Harper has that story. Seoul has so far stuck to offering non-lethal assistance, in line with a long-standing policy of not sending arms to countries at war. NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg made the comments during a visit to South Korea on Monday. I urge uh, the Republic of Korea to uh, continue and to step up on, on the specific issue of military support. I would say that's, at the end of the day, a, a decision for you to make. Uh, but I will say that several NATO allies who had as a policy never to export uh, uh, weapons to, co- uh, to countries in conflict have changed that policy now. Nick Harper reporting. The Treasury Department today announced plans to increase its borrowing during the first three months of this year. The move highlights the ongoing debate over federal spending. It's overtaken Washington as the U.S. government is on track to max out on its $31.4 trillion statutory borrowing authority, also known as the debt ceiling. Treasury officials said today the U.S. plans to borrow $932 billion during the January to March quarter, which is $353 billion more than it announced last October. That's due to a lower beginning of the quarter cash balance and projections of lower than expected income tax receipts. Jackie Quinn reports. The Treasury Department says it needs to increase borrowing for this fiscal quarter, despite the government quickly reaching its $34 trillion limit. Treasury officials say tax receipts came in lower than expected, spending came up higher, and there's less cash on hand than projected for the January to March quarter. That means the government has to borrow $932 billion, several billion more than expected. It comes as Democrats push for an increase in the federal debt ceiling, but the new Republican majority in the House wants to link that to spending cuts, something to be discussed this week between President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Treasury officials say the debate over the debt limit and the threat of a stalemate pose a risk to U.S. financial security. I'm Jackie Quinn. President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy are set to meet on Wednesday at the White House. It will be their first sit-down since McCarthy became Speaker of the House. McCarthy told CBS's Face the Nation this weekend that he wants to address spending cuts along with raising the debt limit as the government tries to avoid a potentially devastating financial default. Catherine Carley reports. Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says he and President Joe Biden could reach a deal on deep budget cuts when they meet this week on the debt ceiling. McCarthy did concede that cuts to Social Security and Medicare are off the table despite pressure from his right. The U.S. hit its debt limit earlier this month. Treasury officials say they can prevent default until summer. I'm Catherine Carley for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. Former President Donald Trump filed a lawsuit today against journalist Bob Woodward claiming he never had permission to publicly release interview recordings made for the book Rage. The lawsuit was filed in federal court in Pensacola, Florida, against Woodward, his publisher, Simon & Schuster, and the publisher's parent company, Paramount Global. Trump's attorneys are seeking nearly $50 million in damages. Simon & Schuster and Woodward released a joint response saying Trump's lawsuit is without merit. They will aggressively defend against it. The statement said all these interviews were on the record and recorded with President Trump's knowledge and agreement. The statement went on to say, moreover, it's in the public interest to have this historical record in Trump's own words. And it said, we're confident that the facts and the law are in their favor. The lawsuit claims that Trump 
consented to being recorded for a series of interviews between December of 2019 and August of 2020, but only for a book Woodward was working on. Rage was published in September of 2021. Trump claims Woodward and Simon & Schuster violated his copyright by releasing the auto recordings in November of 2022 as the Trump tapes Bob Woodward's 20 interviews with President Donald Trump. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online, KPFA. Org. It's an hour-long newscast that airs each night at 6 o'clock. There's a half-hour edition on the weekends. All of our newscasts are available. They're archived online, kpfa.org. They're also available as subscription podcasts. I'm Mark Miracle. British Petroleum is forecasting that the world's emission of global carbon will decrease at a faster rate than predicted just a year ago. BP cites the war in Ukraine and climate provisions in President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act of last year as factors in bringing down world demand for fossil fuels. Giles Gibson reports from London. BP says global demand for oil will fall by 5% by 2035 and 6% for natural gas. It says Russia's invasion of Ukraine is also likely to have, quotes, long-lasting effects on the global energy system. And it believes the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, which contains massive subsidies for green tech, will accelerate the development of wind and solar power. Despite this improved outlook, though, the planet is still far behind the sorts of cuts needed to reach net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. Giles Gibson, London. A trio of California lawmakers today announced they're introducing a package of bills that would require large companies operating in the state to take a greater role in addressing climate change. Max Pringle reports. Democratic State Senator Scott Weiner of San Francisco said his bill, SB 253, would require companies that operate in California and that bring in at least a billion dollars in annual revenue to be more forthcoming about their business's climate impact. Weiner said companies that like to promote their green credentials would actually have to disclose their carbon footprint. By forcing corporations to say what their carbon footprint is, which will give them a huge incentive to reduce their carbon footprint so that they can continue with that marketing in an accurate way. A 2017 study from the British environmental nonprofit CDP showed that just 100 companies are responsible for about 70 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions since 1988. Melissa Romero is Senior Legislative Affairs Manager with California Environmental Voters. She said SB 253 would help keep the public informed about the impacts that large companies are having on the environment. SB 253 closes a critical information gap that exists as a result of a lack of mandatory data collection and reporting requirements of comprehensive greenhouse gas emissions reporting. Opponents, like the California Chamber of Commerce, have argued that the bill would cause unnecessary red tape because large businesses often operate in multiple jurisdictions with different reporting requirements that could gum up the flow of commerce. Senator Weiner introduced a slightly different bill in the legislature last year that failed to clear the assembly. Democratic State Senator Lena Gonzalez has introduced a companion bill, SB 252, which would require CalPERS and CalSTRS, the state's two largest public employee retirement accounts, to divest the estimated $11 billion they invest in fossil fuel companies. SB 252 says one thing, we need to put divestment on the table. Senator Gonzalez says climate change often directly impacts public employees. We need to ensure that this $11 billion is not being invested in, the, in our very detriment. The hardworking firefighters that are putting out our wildfires every year should not be investing their pension funds in the very thing that's causing their health, poor health and, and outcomes that are bad. Gonzalez also introduced a similar bill last year that failed in the Assembly. State Senator Henry Stern has introduced a bill that would require large companies to disclose to investors the financial risk climate change poses to the state's economy. Us as 
the fourth or the fifth largest economy in the world, depending on the day, if we can put our financial power to bear and really leverage it and take the leaders in this state, the corporate partners, some of which my colleagues mentioned, you know, the sales forces out there, and, and see what Silicon Valley will do maybe during not so good of times, not just when times are good, but when there are cuts. Are we going to cut our climate budgets? Are we going to stop these investments? Or are we going to double down? The lawmakers said they expect the first hearings on these bills to be showing up in committees in the state legislature by March or April. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. Local governments are looking to the youth climate movement to get young people involved in civic action. Youth climate councils have been set up in cities across the country, including Portland, giving young people a chance to influence municipal governments on global warming issues. Eric Tegetoff reports from Portland. Nancy Deutsch is director at YouthNex, an interdisciplinary center that promotes effective youth development housed at the University of Virginia. She says young people can be assets in the fight against climate change because they come at the issues from a different perspective. Adolescents are actually really much better than adults at seeing creative solutions, in part because they're open to risk-taking more than adults. And so I think it's really important that youth and youth climate councils are at the table. Deutsch says young people are leading this movement because they will bear the brunt of the damage from increasing temperatures. She also notes that people under 18 aren't able to vote, and so these climate councils provide an outlet for civic engagement. This legislative session, Oregon lawmakers could mull a proposal to allow people to vote starting at age 16. While the councils provide an outlet for young people, some have felt sidelined in these organizations, including the Portland Youth Climate Council, where members have struggled to connect with city policymakers. Deutsch says in order for youth climate councils to be successful and not discouraging, the onus is on adults. Adults have to be willing to listen and take action. And the adults have to make clear what is on the table for the youth and what is not in terms of policy change. Deutsch says another benefit of the councils is that it allows young people to exercise their civic engagement muscles at a younger age. If that experience meets those developmental needs, that's much more likely to become incorporated into how they see themselves and therefore the way they will continue to act in the future because it's become a core part of who they are. For Oregon News Service, I'm Eric Tegadoff. Greeted by the cheerful blare of a train horn, President Joe Biden stood today before a decrepit rail tunnel that he estimated he's been through a thousand times, fearing for decades it might collapse on him. The president came to familiar terrain in Baltimore to promote his 2021 infrastructure law today, a bipartisan win that is just now ramping up the spending on major projects. Biden said replacing the Baltimore and Potomac Tunnel could slash what's now a 60-minute Baltimore to Washington commute in half. The tunnel right now has only one tube, and trains need to slow to just 30 miles an hour to navigate a tight turn on the southern end. Once completed, roughly a decade from now, the new tunnel is expected to have two tubes with up to four tracks total and allow trains to travel more than 100 miles an hour. It will be named for Frederick Douglass, who escaped from slavery in Maryland and became a prominent abolitionist. The total project, which includes related bridges and equipment modernization, could cost $6 billion. Biden also announced labor agreements intended to smooth the tunnel's completion and ensure good wages for union workers. Ed Donahue reports. President Biden hailed plans for a big upgrade for an East Coast rail tunnel. The president was a frequent Amtrak passenger when he was a senator traveling between Washington and his home in Delaware. Anytime I see a train door open, I head for it. The tunnel in Baltimore was around when Ulysses S. Grant was president. This is a 150-year-old tunnel. You wonder how in the hell it's still standing. The idea behind this project is to get more trains through the tunnel faster. New trains will travel through this, this tunnel at 110 miles an hour instead of 30 miles an hour. Mark trains will go from here to Washington in 30 minutes. No money has yet been awarded from the big federal infrastructure bill, but funding does include rail improvements. There is opposition to the project in Baltimore over neighborhood noise. I'm Ed Donahue. 
House Oversight and Accountability Committee Chair James Comer today previewed his priorities for Congress, which he says will include a heavy focus on the handling of classified documents, the origins of the COVID-19 virus, and what he described as possible influence peddling by Hunter Biden. The Kentucky Republican addressed reporters and the public at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. today, taking audience questions and vowing to lead a substantive committee. The panel will begin its work this session with a hearing on Wednesday that will examine potential fraud and abuse of federal pandemic relief dollars, including small business loans and unspent funds left over in federal accounts. Next Wednesday will be the first public hearing to investigate the Bidens, President Joe Biden and his family, including son Hunter. Jackie Quinn reports. Just before Election Day 2020, Twitter had blocked the sharing of a New York Post story about Hunter Biden's laptop after the paper says it received a copy of the hard drive from Donald Trump's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. Three former Twitter executives will be asked to explain that decision next week before the House Oversight Committee. Committee Chairman Republican James Comer told reporters they're investigating the Biden family, alleging influence peddling, saying they want to be sure national security is not compromised. The Post article at the time was greeted with skepticism, with Russia working to denigrate great the Biden campaign. I'm Jackie Quinn. Another mass shooting in California over the weekend killed three and wounded four others at an upscale area in Los Angeles. Police say three people killed were inside a vehicle. Two of the four victims were taken in private vehicles to area hospitals. Two others transported by ambulance. No suspects announced. The shooting took place at a multi-million dollar short-term rental home in Beverly Crest, a neighborhood in the Santa Monica Mountains. It's one of six mass shootings to take place across the country this weekend. According to the Gun Violence Archive, there have been 49 mass shootings in the U.S. this year. The man who wrestled with a gunman at a dance hall in Alhambra in Southern California and prevented a second mass shooting after the Monterey Park massacre, will be President Joe Biden's guest at the nation's capital next week for his State of the Union address that's on tap for a week from tomorrow. Gun violence will likely be one of the topics of Biden's speech that evening. The San Mateo County's district attorney has confirmed that the farm worker charged with killing seven people at two Half Moon Bay farms was enraged by a $100 work-related repair bill from his employer, California Terra Garden. DA Steve Wagstaff said Chen Li Xiao told investigators his his supervisor demanded that he pay for damage to his forklift after it collided with a bulldozer on the mushroom farm. Zhao said the co-worker operating the bulldozer was to blame for the crash. Authorities say the 66-year-old man shot and killed four people, wounded a fifth last week at California Terra Garden in Half Moon Bay, south of San Francisco. He then allegedly went to a former work site, another one, and killed three former co-workers. A new report finds that the company's owner, Jan Min Guan of Fremont, received more than $1 million in PPP pandemic loans for several mushroom farms. California Terra Garden apparently received more than $200,000 in PPP loans that were then forgiven while his workers, while the workers lived there and dilapidated unauthorized housing. The district attorney's office is investigating the living conditions on the farm. Students and teachers return to the Virginia Elementary School today where a six-year-old boy shot his teacher. Steps up security was in place at 
Rich Neck Elementary School in Newport News as it reopened more than three weeks after the January 6th shooting. Police have said the boy brought a 9 millimeter handgun to school and intentionally shot his teacher, Abby Zwerner, as she was teaching her first grade class. Zwerner was hospitalized for nearly two weeks, is now recovering at home. A school district's postperson said two metal detection systems have been installed and two security officers have been assigned to the school. The principal and assistant principal have both left their jobs and a new administrator has been appointed to lead the school. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KP. KFCF in Fresno and online at kpfa.org. This is Brian Edwards Teekert from Upfront. When we're running down a story or an idea or a debate, we follow our research wherever it takes us. We've interviewed everyone from the head of California's Republican Party to an insurrectionist making the case for property destruction. The thing I love about this job is the moment when we ask a question and you can hear the person on the other end thinking. They are off their talking points. You don't know what's going to come out next. Sometimes it's profound. Usually it's interesting. That's why when the news moves fast, we take the time to go deep. It's up front at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! on KPFA. United Nations humanitarian chief and the heads of major aid groups spoke to the press today. After meeting with Taliban leaders in Afghanistan last week in an effort to persuade the ruling Islamic religious group to loosen its tight restrictions on women in the country. Christina Anasad reports. <laughs> United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights Martin Griffiths deplored the Taliban's repression of women in Afghanistan, barring them from working with nonprofits and NGO non-governmental organizations. The message has clearly been delivered that women are central, essential uh, workers in the humanitarian sector, in addition to having rights, um, and we, w- we need to see them back to work. Aid groups say statistics show women account for 30 percent of the 55,000 Afghanis working for international aid groups. According to Save the Children, two-thirds of the Afghan population, some 28 million people, are in need of some aid. 1.6 1.6 million are one step away from famine. CEO and president of the organization, Jaunty Surepto, says the situation is critical. During the winter months, with below freezing temperatures, and the ban on women working is making things worse. We visited a clinic on the outskirts of Kabul run by UNICEF with a local partner. I, I met a mother who was there with three of her seven children, all under the age of 12. Her youngest child, just a baby, was severely malnourished. And in sub-freezing conditions, they arrived with holes in their thin clothes, no socks on. They told us that they have no money for food or for heating, and how her and her children went to bed every night hungry and cold. The staff at the clinic shared horrific statistics with us. 15% of the children seeking help at severe acute malnutrition. This is simply unacceptable. Some aid groups have closed services in the country in response to the Taliban's ban. The UN says the Taliban has made exemptions, allowing some women to continue to work for NGOs that provide health care, for instance. The Taliban has also banned women from attending schools. The United Nations Children's Agency, UNICEF, is urging a return to girls and women in the classroom. Here's Omar Abdi, Deputy Executive Director for Programs at UNICEF. The numbers are alarming. More than one million girls who should have been in secondary schools have lost out on learning for three years now, first due to COVID and then since September 2021 due to the ban on attending secondary school. We are very concerned about girls' and women's development and particularly their mental health. In 2023, if secondary school education remains closed, An estimated 215,000 girls who attended grade 6 last year 
will once again be denied their right to learn. Late last week, the Taliban doubled down its ban on women's education, reinforcing in a message to private universities that Afghan women are barred from taking university entry exams. But aid groups say there are promising signs that Taliban could reverse some of its edicts. Abdi says an estimated 200,000 girls continue to attend secondary school in 12 Afghanistan provinces. The goal, they say, is to stress the importance of women working for aid groups on the Afghan economy and well-being, so more freedoms are given to women and girls in the country. I'm Christina Onestead reporting for KPFA. The death toll from a suicide bomber in Pakistan and a mosque is now at least 59 people with more than 150 wounded. The bombing caused the roof to collapse, and most of the casualties were police. A commander for the Pakistan Taliban claimed responsibility for the attack, which was carried out inside a walled campus where Pakistani police are trained. Pakistan, which is mostly Sunni Muslim, has seen a surge in militant violence since November when the Pakistan Taliban ended their ceasefire with government forces. Labor leaders and lawmakers announced new legislation outside the California State Capitol this morning that would regulate the proposed use of driverless trucks in the state. KPFA's Avery Luke reports. The California Labor Federation and International Brotherhood of Teamsters, which represents truck drivers across the state, are working with legislators on a bill that would restrict the use of autonomous semi-trucks and big rigs on California roads. AB 316 would require a human operator to be behind the wheel of autonomous trucks that weigh more than 10,000 pounds. Last week, the California Department of Motor Vehicles hosted a public workshop to discuss modifying its current restrictions on large driverless trucks and how they would be allowed on California roads without a human operator. California Labor Federation Executive Secretary Treasurer Lorena Gonzalez Fletcher said requiring a human operator for large autonomous trucks would help keep the public safe while maintaining thousands of California jobs. We're asking the DMV and the governor to ensure that safety comes first. Safety has to come first, and that includes a human operator, and jobs have to come first because we're not going to sit back as bad tech, because that exists, bad tech corporations try to eliminate good union jobs. A handful of states, including Arkansas, Nevada, and Texas, have all granted approval for large driverless trucks. But the consideration in California comes amid increased scrutiny over the safety of self-driving vehicles. Last year, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration released figures from automakers documenting nearly 400 crashes of vehicles that had partial driver assist systems. The report shows that 11 people were killed in the U.S. in crashes involving vehicles that were using automated driving systems during a four-month period last year. Tesla alone has had more than 830,000 vehicles on U.S. roads with the systems. Assemblymember and retired highway patrolman Tom Lackey co-authored the bill. He said autonomous trucks can unleash significant and deadly damage. They're significantly harder to slow, control, move in traffic, and divert if there's an accident. The significant damage these vehicles are capable of unleashing is a horrific realization. I place tremendous high value on human life. To know that pedestrians and drivers have already been killed in the development of this nascent technology, I don't think it's too much to ask for an individual to be present to adjust technology in an emergency situation. In a letter to Governor Gavin Newsom, dozens of executives from trucking and autonomous vehicle companies like Waymo, Too Simple, Uber Freight, and UPS urged Newsom and the DMV to begin a public process to allow driverless vehicles in California, which they argue would make the state 
the global hub for the technology that will define the future of transportation. But proponents of AB 316 say that trucks without a human operator pose a significant safety risk. Assemblymember Ash Kalra represents San Jose in the state legislature, and he co-authored AB 316. Kalra said deploying big rig trucks only benefits billionaires. They want to squeeze every single ounce of profit out of each and every one of us. Are we going to fight back? Yeah. Are we going to say not in California? Yeah. We have to make sure that we have safety on the road. Because let's keep in mind, this is not just about the safety of the truck. We're talking about national security. We're talking about goods traveling through our state and through our country. Do you actually want a human being that actually knows what's inside that truck? Yeah. Do you want a human being that can make sure it safely gets from point A to point B? Yeah. That's what this is about. This is about making sure not only our roads are safe, but our goods are safe and our families are taken care of. Proponents of the bill say they will continue to fight to ensure that technological advancement doesn't come at the expense of public safety and jobs. For KPFA News, I'm Avery Luke. According to the just-released 2023 California County Scoreboard of Children's Well-Being, many of California's 13.5 million children and teens have not bounced back yet after the COVID-19 pandemic, especially children of color. Suzanne Potter reports. The report showcases data from all 58 counties and shows wide disparities in indicators of health, education, and more. Kelly Hardy with Children Now says anti-poverty measures during COVID helped a lot, but they were just temporary. 38% are in families making less than two times the poverty level, which is around $60,000 a year for a family of four. So that's a pretty low bar. The data show that the state has more than 170,000 homeless students. And the shortage of state-funded child care continues. The report found in 2017, 2019, and 2021, only one in four working families had access to a space in a licensed child care facility. Susanna Niffen, also with Children Now, says kids in foster care had alarmingly low scores for access to health care and for academic achievement. These kids are facing distinct challenges that other students aren't, and they need a very targeted approach to their education if we're ever going to change the numbers, which are fairly dismal. Vince Stewart, vice president of policy and programs with Children Now, says in terms of education, kids appear to be losing ground as they get older. 42 percent of third graders met or exceeded standards in reading. 31 percent of fifth graders met or exceeded standards in science and 29% of 8th graders met or exceeded standards in math. And then 11th graders, it's only 27% who were deemed ready for college-level math. The report does show some bright spots. California's children have high rates of health insurance, and a high proportion of babies are born at normal birth weight. For California News Service, I'm Suzanne Potter. A freeze warning has been issued tonight for the San Francisco Bay Area, for the Monterey Area, and for the Fresno-San Joaquin Valley. It goes into effect at midnight, lasts until 9 tomorrow morning. Overnight lows are forecast to be in the mid-30s from the San Francisco Bay Area to Monterey and in the upper 20s in Fresno and the San Joaquin Valley. Mostly sunny skies are predicted for the San Francisco Bay Area tomorrow with highs in the mid-50s. In the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow, sunny with highs also in the mid-50s. And that is it for the news tonight for this Monday, January 30th. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening.
Tune in Monday nights on KPFA and kpfa.org starting at 7 p.m. with Africa Today with host Walt Turner. At 8 p.m., it's Transitions on Traditions, a soul sonic rhapsody of word, sound, and power that comes your way with host Greg Bridges. At 10 p.m., end the night right on Don't Disturb This Groove with host Computer Blue. That's Monday nights on KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.